Thanks so much, Sana, and um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I have to share with you, as we're here in the same room, that this is a bit daunting after watching the presentations earlier today. Um, you'll find very quickly that I am not Brene Brown or Sevy Wilson. And oh, by the way, these slides, I made myself at home. So uh, here we are together, and I appreciate your help and your support. Um, no delusions are grander for sure because I've got classmates here, I've got upperclassmen here, the Rossetti brothers uh, sitting in the front row here, both classmate and class of 70 upperclassmen, so I've got to behave myself. Uh, they know all my secrets, I guarantee you. It is an honor in so many ways to be here to relate to the class of 2019, 2020, 2021, and 22, and that includes our Air Force ROTC attendees, uh, we've got some gentlemen and ladies from Aggie Land, from Texas A&M, I talked to this morning. We've got some wonderful uh, enlisted airmen uh, that have been through senior leadership school, senior uh, leadership school, senior NCO Academy, Airman Leadership School. You all, I promise, uh, are the hope for our future, for not just our nation, but for our world, in your character and in your leadership. And, oh, by the way, um, you're better than we were. Uh, even, it'll be 50 years this summer since I first raised my right hand, and please throw a pencil at me or raise your hand if I start talking about how deep the snow was or how tough it was when I went through. Uh, it was tough. Um, but this set, this generation of leaders uh, enlisted, and there's some civilian Air Force leaders here too, and I would call you airmen also. This set of leaders we have here, first of all, held up your right hand in a unique time in the history of our country. Uh, you are willing to serve and to defend our nation when that may not be the most popular choice for a career. So thank you. Um, after being here for a few days, I will not watch CNN or Fox News or any of those guys because they're so negative. You all give, are like taking vitamins being around you. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to start out talking about a true dictator, Saddam Hussein. And by the way, I'm only going to talk about 30, 35 minutes um, and leave some time for questions, I hope. We're starting late to get us back on time. This guy defined ruthless dictator. Uh, you can read about him for yourself, but unexpectedly, he took a, almost a million person modern army military and invaded a sovereign nation, Kuwait, uh, without any warning, early August of 1990. And while the world was surprised, I think, uh, in his ruthlessness, the world also responded. The president at that time, George Herbert Walker Bush, immediately generated a coalition of forces around the world, nations who would send military capabilities to the region to essentially chase Saddam Hussein and his military out of Kuwait, defeat him, and bring peace back to the Middle East region. Saddam Hussein's military was ruthless. When they invaded Kuwait, a modern country, a modern city, Sheraton Hotels, Holiday Inns, they were absolutely horrific. And this is all documented in their human rights violations in how the Iraqi military treated Kuwaiti civilians and the Kuwaiti military. Summary executions and essentially pillaging of Kuwait City and the country of Kuwait for a number of months until we kicked off Desert Storm on 17 January, 1991. Our job, and I'm going to focus on the squadron today, in the 614th Fighter Squadron, then stationed at Torrón Air Base in Spain, was to immediately respond to this attack on a sovereign nation. Uh, I was the commander of a 24 aircraft squadron in Spain. We were all very capable. We were still sitting nuclear alert. We were nuclear capable. And in a very short time, uh, a couple weeks after the, a few weeks after the invasion of Kuwait, late August, we took 24 F-16s to a place no U.S. Air Force unit had ever been stationed before or ever operated from. Doha, Gutter, uh, pronounced Gutter, Q-A-T-A-R, I'll say Gutter, that's one pronunciation. And we landed after seven hours in, in air refueling of F-16s next to Doha International Airport, essentially in a desert, a flat desert. There was no preparation for our forces to arrive, uh, and very quickly we built a forward operating base. Let me talk a bit about squadrons and squadron identity. 
Our Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Goldfein, has it exactly right about enabling and empowering and building more squadrons to fly, fight, and win in airspace and cyberspace. Squadrons are where we fight. That's our identity. This patch, by the way, goes back to World War II and B-17 operations um, against Nazi Germany in the 1943-1945 time, time frame. If you haven't read about Air Force history and the sacrifice of our airmen and listed down officer in B-17 operations, you should, I'd highly recommend you got to do it. It's currency for warfighters. I'm talking to the warfighters here, current and future. And it'll give you a sense of the courage and the commitment that is the pride around this patch as we took it to war again. It's pride and it's courage around a squadron and our identity as lucky devils. When we landed in uh, Gutter, uh, we were met by the U.S. Ambassador uh, to Gutter, the Honorable Mark Hamley. He was about the only preparation there was. And normally, if you're a fighter pilot and you land and the U.S. Ambassador meets you, you're in trouble. <laughs> in this case, Ambassador Hamley said, boy, are we glad to see the lucky devils. We quickly rearmed. Uh, it was 110 degrees. The KC-10 operators kept their APUs running. We cycled on and off the KC-10s to stay cool. And we were ready to go to war in a very few minutes, refueled and ready. And Ambassador Hamley stood there and watched us and said, you know, we were very concerned about Saddam Hussein taking his million-person military with some 750,000, 500,000 deployed military in and around Kuwait. Very concerned about Saddam Hussein continuing to press into Saudi Arabia to Bahrain to gutter. So thank you for being here in a very responsive way, and oh, by the way, ahead of the Army and the Marine Corps, to defend um, our, our, uh, our expatriates, our U.S. and British citizens living in Gutter, um, and the Guttery, uh, and, the, and the country, the nation of Gutter. We immediately started training. I think looking back, some of the best training I could have imagined in my career flying combat aircraft. We had French Mirage F-1s there uh, when we landed flying um, air defense missions. We became very close partners with our French Air Force counterparts. They were terrific. Um, because the Iraqis flew the same airplane, uh, at the squadron level again, our French friends went back to Paris, got all the information on the Iraqi enemy aircraft, radar frequencies, all that, and shared it with us. And then we shared it around the AOR, shared it with headquarters, shared it with the intelligence community, never to be seen again. And, and that's the kind of co cohesion and the partnership we had uh, with our French forces. And then our Guttery and Mary forces were very professional. Uh, as a squadron flying F-1s, um, we trained with them every day. They were our aggressors as we trained to drop our weapons and do what multi-role F-16 squadrons do, hit the target and kill the enemy. And over time, the Canadians also deployed their F, um, F-18s uh, with us. So we had a a terrific combined training force from August up through the start of the war in uh, January of 91. In addition to that, over time, uh, the Gutter and Mary Air Force took their F-1s and the little Alpha jet and bombed targets, Iraqi held targets in Kuwait, and we escorted them side by side because we didn't want them to be um, mistaken for Iraqi F-1s, and so we were right there with them as they also took the fight to the enemy forces, the Iraqi enemy forces in Kuwait. By uh, December, January of um, 91, we were ready. We had almost 1,000 people uh, in the 401st Provisional Wing, led by a wonderful wing commander, uh, Colonel Jerry Nelson, who uh, had deployed with us. Uh, we'd build our own bomb storage area. We'd build up our weapons, including uh, Mark 8, uh, 2,000 pound Mark 82 shown on the lower right, and cluster munitions, uh, advanced cluster munitions to take out uh, Iraqi forces, ground forces across Kuwait and in the Kuwait theater of operations. Again, we were one of many squadrons in the U.S. Air Force deployed, along with Navy squadrons flying off of uh, carriers and Marine squadrons deployed, along with coalition forces. Uh, French, for example, the British were all there with us. So this was a a combat air force, if you will, that had been unseen, I think, uh, in history. Uh, we were ready to attack that large three quarters of a million uh, force ground, uh, ground, ground based enemy and their, and their air capabilities and their surface air capabilities. And we were very confident that we could take the fight to the enemy. Let me uh, go uh, to the morning of 17 January 1991. The first combat mission 
for all of us in the 614 squadron, including our maintainers. The circle uh, is around my crew chief, senior master, or then tech sergeant, Mike Hare. Our crew chiefs and our pilots, all very close, all work together as a team. By the way, just like B-17s went to war in World War II, we were an enlisted and officer team. I'll take you to the ramp, uh, I'll try to put you on the ramp. Uh, at our air base in Doha, Gutter, the morning of 17 January 1991. My, our first combat mission. We have 16 F-16s lined up, pointed, north, pointed south, uh, crew chiefs all lined up in front of their F-16s, just like they ever did every day. And about 200 of our cheerleaders, if you will, on the ramp, uh, there to support us in our first combat operation. So the ramp is covered with airmen. Um, we were very proficient in our survive to operate capability. Quickly putting on uh, chemical, biological, radiological protective gear. Uh, we could do that in about five minutes and we knew uh, the time of flight for Iraqi Scud missiles was about 11 minutes to where we were located in Gutter. So we knew we could beat that and we'd practice over and over and over to quickly get into our protective gear, find a hole, and survive to operate. Not to quit, but to fight through the attack and to continue to take the fight to the enemy. We had not practiced, however, for a Scud launch coming from the north five minutes prior to taxi. We screwed that up. Um, so here we are, my first combat mission, engines running, scud alert. Now I look out across the ramp, because it's about five more minutes before I can taxi, I've got to get uh, my inertial navigation system up to speed so I can drop accurate bombs, and the ramp is bedlam. It looks like the Keystone Cops. People are running in full gear, trying to put their mop gear on, headed for a hole, uh, bread trucks trying to run into each other, but in about five minutes, the ramp is cleared off. There's nobody on the ramp. Everybody's in their protective gear or in a hole. Except for 16 crew chiefs and 16 F-16s and 16 pilots. Now, Tech Sergeant Mike Hare is on the comm cord with me, as he did every day. And I said, you know, Mike, as I watch the ramp clear off, and I think about those scuds coming over my shoulder and impacting where he's standing with a chemical, biological, radiological warhead, potentially, I said, Mike, you need to unhook and find a hole. Put your protective gear on. I don't need you anymore, buddy. You've done great. Thank you. I'm going to roll out of these chocks and take off in just a few minutes, and I need to get these jets off the ground and go to war. And Tech Sergeant Harris said, Sir, I'm standing right here, standing right here until you taxi. And he did. When it came time for him to unplug, he did. He wrapped his comm cord up, and he stood there, and as I taxied out, saluted, just like he did every day, out in the open, and I looked down the ramp, and 15 crew chiefs are doing the same thing. As I continue to roll down the taxiway and down the runway and take off, my six, our, our 16 crew chiefs are still looking at their airplanes and their pilots on the ramp, totally exposed, absolutely fearless, to make sure that this first combat mission, for many of them too, got off right and we took the fight effectively to the enemy. Well, here's uh, the first morning of Desert Storm. Again, I apologize that these aren't the perfect slides that get generated if you have a CAG. I don't have a CAG anymore. Um, a thousand sorties during the first 24 hours of Desert Storm. Combat air forces from U.S. Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the French, the British, all hitting designated targets across Iraq and deep into Iraq, around the, Korea, uh, the Kuwaiti theater of operations, around the country of Kuwait, and inside Kuwait itself where the Iraqis held airfields. Our mission for the Lucky Devils was to hit two airfields in, uh, in Kuwait, Ali al Salim and al Jaber, and we did that. Uh, we did not need air refuel like some of the other forces did because we were relatively close to the target uh, where we uh, took off from in gutter. And that just gives you an idea of a war over about a month and a half as often advertised as a 100-hour ground war or a 100-hour war. This was about a 45-day war, if you will, against almost a three-quarters of a million enemy ground forces, well-equipped, with very capable anti-aircraft, surface-air, radar-guided surface-air missiles and AAA. 
And this force that you see here portrayed caused Saddam Hussein and his military to surrender and leave Kuwait. And we do this every day. Our, uh, our force of F-16s, our one squadron flew 32 sorties a day, 16 in the morning and 16 in the afternoon. And again, we were just one of many squadrons deployed to that part of the world over that period during Desert Storm. I came back successfully, and I always show this picture of me to show how uh, I'm glad that I married up. I'm glad my wife married me. Um, who I'm really wanting you to meet is the guy that's talking to me, and we'll talk more about him. But this is then Major John Nips Nichols, 78 graduate of our Air Force Academy. And the reason he's so interested, that afternoon he's going to lead 16 more airplanes, F-16s, to Iraq for the first time. So he's listening to every word I have to share with him, and he's a hero. The next day, the 18th, I led another force of uh, F-16, F 16 F-16s in the morning. Uh, he led the 16 aircraft force in the afternoon to go, and uh, he led then uh, the mission I'm going to focus on a bit on the afternoon of 19 January 91 against targets in Baghdad. When I landed uh, the morning of 19 January, the guys uh, from my mission uh, into Iraq and talked to my guys who were about to go to war that afternoon, here's the map they showed me. And this is a, looks kind of crude, but this is the best we could do back then. Um, this is a cockpit map uh, pilots took for this mission on the afternoon of the 19th. The black at the top of the, the picture is Baghdad, covered by radar guided AAA and missiles. The black lines coming in from south to north are essentially defined the route for our 16 F-16s, led by John Nichols. And if you look closely, you'll see a 2 or a 3 or a 6 or an 8. Those little numbers on the map actually describe the threats in those pictures around the map. An SA, a radar-guided SA-8, radar-guided SA-2, radar-guided SA-6, radar-guided SA-3. These are very lethal, capable radar-guided missiles. And while we had countermeasures, we had wild weasels, we had EF-111 jammers, we had our own onboard countermeasures, it's a pretty daunting uh, threat environment that John Nichols and his flight of F-16s are going to lead into Kuwait, I'm sorry, into ba downtown Baghdad the afternoon of 19 January. The target was the Dura Refinery Complex, a relatively large complex uh, that was certainly a strategic target for Saddam Hussein's military, uh, obviously where he got a lot of his fuel resources. So in the next slide, I'm going to put you in the cockpit. You think we'll have audio? Okay, we'll try for audio. I'm sorry we won't have that, but I'll try to describe anyway without the audio. Uh, Major E.T. Emmett Tulia uh, was one of 16 pilots that afternoon fo following John Nichols. And uh, 77 grad of the Air Force Academy, uh, there with his crew chief, Eddie Dowell. And um, the next video is from E.T.'s cockpit. You'll see his heads-up display, and this same heads-up display is in all, all the uh, F-16s engaged in this fight. Uh, you'll see um, airspeed and altitude on the uh, left and the right. You'll see a little number in the lower left, 6.7. That's how many Gs he's pulling. And for some of you, a G is the body, your body weight. So he's, he's maneuvering with, at a level of six to seven times his own body weight. It's a maneuvering fight as he does everything he can to get his bombs on target first and survive and fight the next day. And he and the rest of his squadron mates in this flight uh, called Stroke Flight. And I'm sorry, again, you can't hear the video. You'd hear, hear the comms. But we'll give this a shot, and maybe the video will come up. What do you think, Bailey? Maybe. Yeah, you can barely hear it. So he's maneuvering aggressively. Um, Stroke 3, you're on your own. Trying to find the Dura refinery. Stroke 3, spinal. Airspeed on the left. He's at about 27,000 feet on the right. I apologize, the video the audio was fine uh, yesterday. 20 at 27. Just in the back you can hear a rattlesnake tone. Those are all radar guided missiles. Uh, trying to find targets and kill. 
Let's do a confirm, sour. Big circle means he's getting close to the range to the Baghdad refinery. Target locator line. And the F-16 was pretty good at that time. We were persistently dropping bombs within about five meters of where we, where we poked him, where we, where we dropped him. Even though he's getting targeted by, uh, SA, by SAMs, uh, he hits the target, bombs come off here shortly. Picture slits one eight zero. Immediately south. Try to get away from the target. On his way out. And by the way, uh, if you're interested, this is all over YouTube. You can hear the whole thing. So I apologize we couldn't show it today, but you can go back and certainly review this. I, if you just call F sixteen Desert Storm, uh, this has been a training camp for many years. Also combat air forces. Um, you can get a marvelous job, of not just hitting the target, but fighting the wind, fighting through the attack. Got multiple SAMs and AAA. He could only descend to about 10,000 feet because he said it was like walking on a cloud of AAA. He couldn't go any lower to get more air speed, so he could maneuver more effectively. Negative bad during that time. And I think there were upwards of a dozen SAM shots that fortunately were missed. Why don't we just go to the next slide, Bailey? Uh, audio. Okay, we got BDA. Uh, this uh, yellow uh, is an excerpt from the Gulf Times, and uh, you can read it. They said uh, the Indian oil workers that were there said the bombers from the U.S.-led coalition targeted the refinery on January 19th, destroying the plant but leaving workers unhurt in nearby living quarters. The bombing was directed so well that not even a wall on the other side of the compound collapsed. And even better, the Dura refinery burned for about two weeks. It was a good attack. On the bottom of this slide is a repeat of a stencil that was put over the door of our ops trailer the 19th of January, 91 because two of our pilots were shot down on this mission. Tico Tice, Major Jeff Tice, and Captain Mike Roberts, MR. And we did not know if they were alive or dead. We knew they'd been shot down. Uh, possible uh, communications from, from uh, Tico. Uh, we thought we might recover him. Turns out he got captured by Bedouins. And we did not even see a parachute for Mike Roberts. So we did not know if either one of these guys were alive or dead. But the point I want to make about this stencil is in the middle of the night, somebody in the 614th Lucky Devils, in letters about this high, put that stencil over the top of the ops trailer door. And the next morning, when we were tasked again to take 16 F 16s to Iraq, every pilot mounted up, put on their gear, walked through that door, and slapped that door jam with a look of grim determination that was motivated by the fact their two brothers were shot down. The Iraqi military did not win that day because they shot down two of our guys. They just pissed us off. We continued to take the fight to the enemy for some weeks after that. This is a view graph. Now this view graph way of depicting information was before PowerPoint. It's hard to believe that anything was before PowerPoint, but this is a view graph. I had to show it to you. It's kind of a historical document. The point, though, I'm trying to make is 1,300 sorties, one F-16 squadron, in about a month and a half, 3.6 million pounds of bombs. That's what one F-16 squadron, that's what your Air Force and your air power can bring to the fight every day against a three-quarters of a million person enemy ground force. That's what we do. That's who we are. And we do it across the airspace and cyber domains. We do it more effectively, much more effectively today than we did in 1991. We're much more accurate, we're much more lethal. And we also still do it at the squadron level. On the FMC rate, uh, full mission capable is what that means since your last. Uh, normally in peacetime, you want to be at about, uh, you're good at about 85, 80 percent back then. Uh, you may know that Secretary Mattis, before he departed, demanding that our Air Force got, got us to 80 percent. Well, during war, our crew chiefs, in the middle of war, with jets getting shot at, 
you know, hot, cold, uh, running around in protective gear, generated an 87.2 uh, FMC rate. And, uh, and that's kind of typical of uh, what we do when the pressure's on in combat operations. I'll also tell you that none of us would tell you we were a hero. We were able to do that because we got incredible support from across the Air, Air Force, from the states, from everywhere. Uh, bombs are showing up every night in C-130s, new engines, uh, just amazing. Um, I'll depart a little bit. We got an engine, a brand new engine shipped from uh, General Electric, Cincinnati. And when a new engine comes in, it's shrink-wrapped, as this one was, but it was shrink-wrapped twice. And it was Christmas of 1990. Inside the second wrap of shrink-wrap shrink were probably 500 Christmas cards from the folks in, G in the GE plant in Cincinnati built that engine. I'll never forget GE. They're my kind of people, and I'll never forget what they did, not just to build that engine, but to send us all a Christmas card. Again, this is what air power does. When the ground war kicked off, um, and the large force of U.S. infantry, U.S. soldiers and Marines and their coalition counterparts uh, moved into Iraq and Kuwait, um, the Iraqi military began to run. Uh, this picture, set of pictures, is known as the Highway of Death. Uh, probably more destruction than death, because when the Iraqi military had been so ruthless and committed so many human rights violations, began to go north and try to get out of the way of our ground forces, they left those vehicles and ran to the desert. So we killed some of them, but we killed a lot of their stuff. And I'd offer this, this picture's repeated all the way to Baghdad. Even though this is where Western reporters were able to take pictures, uh, our last mission that I led our desert storm was right over the Euphrates where the Iraqis were trying to had put pontoon bridges and were trying to get their forces across the Euphrates River back to Baghdad and we we tore them up uh, again with flights of F-16s uh, once they started retreating and I only show this picture for a couple reasons not to brag certainly but just to talk about the power of air power there were courageous tank battles fought by our US soldiers in, in just terrific acts of capability and courage across uh, our soldiers on the ground against the Iraqi military. Uh, but I would offer that air power had the Iraqi military pretty defensive uh, by the time our soldiers entered the fight. Thousands of Iraqi soldiers just gave up. They were ready to surrender after getting pounded by squadrons dropping 3.6 million pounds of bombs each on them. Um, there are many stories about Iraqis who, Iraqi military, uh, professional military who just did not want to fight but would rather just give up, uh, finally get some food and water. Um, and it's kind of amazing, one young soldier, escort, and uh, some pretty significant numbers of Iraqi soldiers who just did not want to fight anymore. We had redeployed in about March of 1991. Uh, a few weeks after that, Mike Roberts and Tico Tice came home. They fought their own fight. In Baghdad, as prisoners of war, they were tortured, they were interrogated, um, and we did not know they were alive until about two days after they were shot down because Saddam Hussein put his prisoners on CNN. And good news, bad news, they were alive. Bad news, they were prisoners of Saddam Hussein. The evening of 19 January, my wife Carrie. Uh, when we didn't know if Mike Roberts was alive or not, my wife Carrie, along with the flight surgeon and the chaplain, had to go back in Spain to Mike Roberts' house to talk to his wife, Patty, who was nine months pregnant, and explain to her that her husband might be dead. Two days later, Patty, along with the rest of us, uh, saw Mike alive on CNN uh, when she was at an OB appointment, and their baby, Drew, was born while Mike Roberts was a prisoner in Baghdad. Mike went on to uh, command an F-16 wing in the Air National Guard, Ohio Air National Guard. Uh, Tico served an entire career in our Air Force, uh, became an American Airlines captain, and uh, no better uh, pilots, no bigger heroes in our lucky devil time in Desert Storm uh, than these two guys. It's important for me to acknowledge the character and leadership and courage of our military families, all military families. We don't go to war just as the guys and girls in uniform. There's always, most of the time, a family there 
Our two daughters, three and seven, became four and eight while their dad was deployed. Carrie took care of them. She took care of spouses whose husbands were shot down. And she took care of an entire squadron during the time of Desert Shield and Desert Storm squadron of wives. And she's probably got more war stories than I do. And honestly, I think may have had a much tougher job than I did uh, dropping bombs and getting shot at. Courage, leadership, and character across our military and our Air Force families. In closing, I've talked about five of my exemplars, exemplars five of my heroes. Uh, we're going to get together, by the way, and have another reunion next uh, in April, crew chiefs and pilots. And they would tell you they're not heroes. They're five of some thousands and thousands of airmen who fought and won the fight against Saddam Hussein and his army in 1991. John Nichols, Nips, my assistant ops officer, went on to be a major general in the uh, Air National Guard and just took his uniform off finally after 40 plus years as the adjutant general for the state of Texas. Nips, uh, you've probably seen on TV side by side with Governor Abbott, working hurricane relief, uh, also responsible for leading Middle East uh, soldiers and uh, uh, guard uh, soldiers and uh, Airman Guardsman from Texas in the Middle East, and a great example of, of leadership, my exemplar. Uh, as I talked about, Tico went on to the American Airlines, Mike Roberts, um, a, uh, a wing commander. Let me talk just a minute about E.T. E.T. Tulia, who you saw maneuver and fight the fight. Um, he went on to be a South, retired, as, uh, retired from the Air Force, went on to be a Southwest Airlines uh, captain, and I asked him if he could talk to, talk to me a little bit about what he had done and his courage and his character and his leadership in life. He wouldn't send me a note, but fortunately his wife Diane did. So here's what Diane sent me about my exemplar ET. Nine years as a volunteer firefighter and qualified EMT for our fire department critical instant stress management volunteer for Southwest Airlines and the fire department in Travis County, led and adopt a pilot program at Southwest Airlines, mentoring at-risk children in the Austin Independent School District, professional standards representative for the Houston pilots at Southwest Airlines, and selected as one of a handful of people chosen by Southwest Airlines as a volunteer of love for his dedication to service as a volunteer firefighter and EMT. And Diane notes, this award is very select, and the standards are high for those chosen for the award. It's a mighty big kudo at Southwest Airlines to be chosen for this award. I also got my crew chief, Mike, here to send me a note, and I gotta share this with you. Uh, Mike retired after 26 years in our Air Force as a senior master sergeant, went to work for the Defense Contract Management Agency, and here's what he wrote to me. Truth is, sir, I've had one hell of a ride. I'm sure most of what I wrote doesn't mean a whole lot, but I'm proud, I'm proud of what I've been able to accomplish. accomplish. As I tell people, not bad for a Baltimore City public school educated Yahoo. The one thing I can say is joining the Air Force was the best decision I made in life. It gave me the experience, opportunities, and tools to be where I am today. However, what I do today, I do as a commitment to today's warfighter. I know how it feels to be the end user of a part that doesn't work. My job now is to be a good steward of the taxpayer's money, ensuring we get what we pay for. But more than that, my job is ensuring that the guy in the field, what the guy in the, guy in the field needs, he gets, and it works. And it's the deep-rooted brotherhood in me that makes me do exactly that. This is exactly, is exactly what I push for, how I lead my team, and how I'm grooming the next generation of leaders. So Mike Hare, E.T. Tulia, John Nichols, Tico Tice, Mike Roberts, my heroes, and in closing, so are all of you. Our nation needs you like never before. It's an honor to continue to support you, to be here with you, share a couple of war stories. Um, I told Sana, um, she's got all my contact information, especially for the classes of 
19, 20, 2019, 20, 21, and 22, ROTC Academy uh, enlisted officer, future officer. Give me a call. Uh, I got time for you. Or I'll connect you to one of these heroes who are happy to talk to you about the weather or life or whatever you want to talk about at that point in your life. We're there for you. Well, thanks again. We may have a minute or two for questions, but I think at least I'll get us back on time. God bless. Time for about one question. One question. I did not plan any questions, so please. No, no, I please. So, Daryl, how would you describe your, your squadron after the deployment? How did it change from before? So, the question is how the squadron changed post Desert Storm uh, from how, how we were uh, pre Desert Storm. Well, we grew up and got closer as families, as professionals, and as friends for life. Uh, and that's, that's not a new story, coming out of combat operations and getting shot at together and surviving. Um, I look back now, and, and we appreciate each other when we're serving together and we're in uniform. The gift I would offer of being almost 68 years old is the treasure of the memories. I was blessed with being able to hang out with the best human beings in the world over almost 50 years. Uh, so that's how I describe the pre and the post. We were ready and, and we were courageous and we were fired up. We got real and we got shot at, but boy, it didn't slow us down. Uh, no bad guys, I believe, will ever defeat the ethos that comes from growing up in a free country and having really the opportunity to fight for that country to preserve what we know um, as a nation uh, that's founded on uh, freedom for all and all created equal. So that's how I'd answer that. I think that's it.